Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming out. I'm Tom Landy. I'm the director of the McFarland Center for Religion, Ethics, and Culture. And among the many programs we sponsor at the McFarland Center, one of the best things that I get to do is serve as host to international visiting Jesuit fellows who come here to the college for a uh, semester or a year. Uh, we were able to do that because of a generous gift from the Jesuit community here. Uh, they come to enrich the life of the college, to do some research and teaching while they're here. Uh, Jesuits, we've had 23 Jesuits so far from many, many countries around the world. Uh, they have time and resources to pursue scholarship, to collaborate with American scholars, and to build a better sense of the global Jesuit community. This spring, I'm really pleased to welcome Father George Caruvalil, uh, from uh, a Jesuit from the Theology at Pune, the Pontifical Athenaeum in India. He's professor of philosophy there. It's the uh, Jnana Deepa Vajapati. Vidyapit. Vidyapati. Okay. We practiced beforehand. So yeah. See how good I am at this. Uh, where he previously served as dean of the Faculty of Philosophy. Uh, he edited the book Romancing the Sacred Towards an Indian Christian Philosophy of Religion in 2007, and is the editor of Jnana Deepa, uh, Pune authored the Pune Journal of Religious Studies. He's authored over 50 articles on a wide range of topics, including epistemology, hermeneutics, ecology, politics, and society. At Holy Cross, Father Groville teaches a course titled Philosophers, God, and India, and studies epistemologies underlying Christian theology and the relationship between faith and reason. Today, he'll talk to us on the nature of mysticism in his talk, titled God, Idea, and Experience. So please join me in welcoming Father George. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for the warm welcome and the introduction. And glad to see all of you. Thank you very much for coming on this uh, evening of uh, Valentine's Day. Hopefully, uh, this will make you, uh, enable you to a little more to fall in love with God, to, under, to un understand that a little better, hopefully. So, I shall begin by just, this is the title. And this is the basic, you know, the, the, what I'm going to do, the basic, uh, the important things that are there. A little bit of an introduction about the background, um, and then something about some description, some examples of nature mysticism. Then, from those examples, I will pick out some features of nature mysticism, and see whether those features enable us to help understand God better. That is the basic uh, God better, especially in the, in the background. I will say what that uh, why I say that, so, and then finally, I'll, so let us proceed to the first. The background of this topic is basically two traditions that we have: two traditions in philosophy, natural theology. One is of natural theology tradition. This is basically says. There are some minimal things about God that can be known by using natural reason. Natural reason which is available to all. This is the first tradition. So natural here means without the help of any revelation or scripture or anything of that kind by using that which is available to all. For example, God's existence can be known this way through arguments. This is a tradition coming to us from Aristotle, Aquinas, and the people of that kind. The second tradition, which needs to be, uh, is the religious experience tradition. This basically says God is to be known from experience, not ideas or arguments. This, uh, along with it, goes the idea that the soul of religion is a certain kind of experiences and not the ideas and doctrines. This comes to us basically from, at least comes to prominence since 19th century with the German theologian Schleimacher with his book, The, Cult the Speeches to the Cultured Despisers of Religion. So basically it was oriented to those who did not believe or they found religion problematic. So the, my presentation is at the meeting point of both these traditions. So, some, um, so that's what I will be doing. So each tradition has its own problems. That is, the experience tradition has 
experiences one doctor to one uh, important philosopher the each tradition each religious tradition their experiences will vary according to their prior beliefs and practices steven katz from uh, boston university experiences of christians uh, uh, jews muslims and hindus are all different he would say question is are there not some experiences that are universal like the natural reason of natural theology problem with the other tradition that is natural theology tradition basically what does god mean at the end of all the proofs he says this is what we call god but what does it mean because theology theists there is a theistic understanding where god is a supernatural being who is both immanent as well as transcendent what do those thing terms mean we shall see and then there is a deistic tradition the which is a modern development development during the modern period now deism i say want to say something about that is because that is the unconsciously it has crept into a lot of religious belief it emerged during the modern period according to this doctrine god created the world and its laws how the world functions that also is god's creation but afterwards he doesn't interfere with it. the world runs on its own world is like a machine which he wound once put up the battery and then it works on its own which means there are no miracles no revelation no whether jesus or moses or muhammad or anybody uh, because the basic argument is god cannot be partial to anyone therefore does the deistic god is one who transcends the world he is above somewhere but he has created the world but not present here this is contrary to a theistic understanding and that is why i raise the question are there experiences that can help even atheists to understand the theistic idea of god this is the basic issue that i am taking up so claim of this presentation is yes there is a class of experiences that are not religion specific and various people have studied this and it is some people call it nature mysticism which is easier some others call it extrovertive mysticism the and the, the claim is that these can help us help anyone to understand what they is mean by god without having the problems of immanent transcendence okay nature mysticism first of all unlike what cat says there is this class of mysticism is universal is available to anybody not that it ha- must 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 happen to anybody no but it is available whether you are this is what i got give a quotation there this may occur to may occur not that it has to may occur to anyone whatever his religious faith or lack of it and whatever moral immoral or amoral life he may be leading at the time so quote from zainer and therefore they are accessible to all even our new atheist like richard dawkins he acknowledges this kind of experiences are there but then he denies that it is anything to do with the supernatural and that is the thing we shall take up at the end so first let us get some familiarity with nature mysticism nature mysticism what first what it is not if i start a little away from there it's easy for me to look there and talk to you so what it is not it is not an experience of nature that fills us with grateful admiration and makes us ask how and where from why i say it is not because this is cogitating over our experience of nature thinking about it to arrive at god as a source of this wonderful creation and this is the way of natural theology nature mysticism involves no cogitation over nature and i shall point out by giving you some examples this is first example is a very short one but it is a longer from a longer poem of william blake those who are in literature will know this 
to see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. Just the four lines I have taken from there. Another example, which is which much longer, this is Beath Griffiths, an Englishman, who, a Benedictine, who came to India and living there. He, says he, he has his autobiography in which he narrates this. Those of you are familiar with um, Charles Taylor, his book, Secular Him, uh, Age, has this whole narration there. So he says, one day, during my last term at school, I walked out alone in the evening and heard the birds singing in that full chorus of song, which can only be heard at that time of the year, at dawn or sunset. I remember now the shock of surprise with which the sound broke on my ears. It seemed that I had never heard the birds singing before, and I wondered whether they sang like this all year round and never noticed it. He continues, as I walked on, I came upon some hawthorn trees in full bloom, and again I thought that I had never seen such a sight or experienced such sweetness before. If I had been brought suddenly among the trees of paradise, trees of the garden of paradise, and heard the choir of angels singing, I could not have been more surprised. I came thus to where the sun was setting over the playing fields. A lark rose suddenly from the ground beside the tree where I was standing and poured out its song above my head and then sang still singing to rest. This is... Everything then grew still as the sunset faded and the veil of dusk began to cover the earth, I remember now a feeling of awe which came over me. I felt inclined to kneel on the ground as though I had been standing in the presence of an angel. Next example. Third, the major incident in my life occurred when I was at school aged 14. One hot Sunday afternoon in June 1949, lying on my back on an old tree, an old under a lime tree, aware of the scents and sounds of summer and watching the flickering sunlight through the leaves of the lime tree, my mind went blank. I suddenly found myself surrounded, embraced by a white light which seemed to both come from within and from without. A very bright light, but quite unlike any ordinary physical light. I was filled with an overwhelming sense of love, of warmth, peace and joy. A love far, far greater than any human love could be. Utterly accepting, giving, compassionate, total love. I seemed to sense a presence, but did not see anybody. So now, with these three, two, three examples, I'm going to narrate some of the characteristic features of this kind of experiences by raising some questions. First, what is that is experienced? Is it nature? Is it a grain of sand or a wild flower singing your birds or trees in blossom? Or is it sunset, etc.? Or is it what is experienced? We must assume that what is, this is not the first time that Griffiths had seen trees in bloom or birds, in, birds singing or witness a sunset and so on. Probably it's hopefully not the first time. But in, the, in this particular experience, there is something entirely new. That's why he says, never seen such, such sight or experienced such sweetness before. Words like shock of surprise, wonder, or point to the fact that these experiences are utterly unlike ordinary experiences of nature. And that's why I call it, there is a drastic contrast 
with our ordinary sense experience. And another scholar of religion, um, experience, Rudolf Otto, called this feature as the holy other character of religious experience. That by which he meant that which is beyond the sphere of the usual, the intelligible, the familiar. The more religious terms for this contrast is the sacred as against the profane or the secular. Now that is so therefore drastic holy other character of the experience. Second one is a twofold character. Senses are involved in these experiences. Senses are not closed. Experiences take place in and through nature, but not but these are not experiences of nature. Therefore, we must distinguish between the locus of experience, which is nature, the sand, the flower, the trees, lark, etc. So the locus of the, the, where the experience takes place is nature, but the object experienced is not. Something more than nature is experienced here. That I put that capital more is basically referring to William James. But I have borrowed that term from him, but... So it is world in the sand, heaven in flower, eternity in an hour, choir of angels, garden of paradise, etc. So there's something more than nature that is experienced. It is as if the natural world of the senses is a covering for the reality that is experienced. That's a quote from Mustaka, Mustakasait, Mustaka, Mustakasait is pronounced. So I will narrate his experience. Here, he gives another example. Many times I have found courage and strength and beauty through loneliness in an experience with nature. One day I was feeling deeply depressed by the severe criticisms a colleague had received, a person who was living his life in an honest and truthful sense. Nothing was real. After the children had gone to bed, I decided to go for a walk. The night was dark filled with black clouds, large white flakes of snow fell on and around me. Inside, a surging restlessness replaced my benumbed state. Without, suddenly, without understanding in any way, I experienced a transcendental beauty in the white darkness. It was difficult to walk on the glazed, iced surface. That's only a picture. So he continues, immediately I felt a chill, but at the same time I felt the ice being warmed as my fingers touched it. It was a moment of communion, an experience of knowing and understanding, and a feeling of complete solace. I felt my inward heaviness lifting, and I discovered a new capacity for, for facing conflicts which existed around and in me. And then he says, we need only to reach out, in reach out in natural covering to come face to face with creation. So that is uh, a third feature which I want to point out is a noetic quality, a quality of something knowing. William James called this realization that nature is only a cover for a deeper reality as a noetic quality of experience, mystical experience. It means that this kind of experience is not merely a state of feeling but of knowing. Note that what is known is not nature but is not natural experience. Okay. So the noetic quality, fourth feature is a positive value that is given to it. An extremely positive valuation of the experienced more. Mustaka, Mustakas begins to think that nature is only a cover for the real thing that is hidden. Griffiths talks about choir of angels of sweetness never experienced before. Later, Griffiths would reflect on his experience and say, We only begin to make wake to reality when we realize that the material world, the world of space and time, 
as it appears to our senses, is nothing but a sign and a symbol of a mystery which infinitely transcends it. In some cases, this positive value is due to the welcome change in their existential situation brought about by the experience. For example, that of Mustakas uh, moves from a stage of depression, numbness and restlessness, futility, nothing was real, to a state of communion and solace, knowing and understanding. In other cases, there is no prior condition that calls for change. Where well, other give this example for even there the aftermath of the experience is similar. There is an inexplicable sense of joy and sweetness that comes over the experience. Another feature that is which is related to the third the positive valuation is that this kind of positive value given to it has an impact on the life of the person. A positive results in a change in one's orientation. For example, Griffith's response to his experience was, as a schoolboy, he says, he made it a habit to rise before the dawn to hear the birds singing, to stay late in the night to watch the stars, and to go for walks in the countryside, to be in nature. Opening sentence of most Sarkas also indicates that it was a habit with him to go into nature when he felt lonely. He says, many times I have found courage, etc. Another nature mystic, Dr. Buck, or Buck, he says, the memory of his experience and the sense of reality of that, what it taught, has remained during the quarter of a century which has since elapsed. And here is his experience. If there is also a felt sense of presence, he indicates that is the next one, which I, I seemed to sense as presence, but did not see anybody, from example three, or William James today, a sense of presence of a higher and friendly power. Here, a live presence is not about living things in nature even because even dead things or things like stone can be seen to be alive at this time. Here I give this narration from Dr. Buck. I had spent the evening with two friends. We parted at midnight. I had a long time to my lodging. My mind was calm and peaceful. All at once, without warning of any kind, I found myself wrapped in a flame-colored cloud. For an instant, I thought of fire. The next I knew that the fire was within myself. This is quoted by William James. He would say, among other things, I did not merely come to believe, but I saw that the universe is not composed of dead matter, but is on the contrary, a living presence. So with these five, six characteristics, I have a, a sort of called out from the experiences. Now, does it, now, can we say anything about what the reality that is experienced? That's a question now which I'm taking up. Is it God? Can we apply these descriptions to derive the concept of God? Yes, these descriptions fit well with the theistic understanding of God. To begin with, God is real, the noiety quality. Direct and, and uh, mystics have always emphasized the fact that God is known directly and encountered with the real. Con second, drastic contrast or holy, holy other. God is so unlike the objects of sense experience that Aquinas would say, we cannot know what God is, but rather what he is not. And he goes on to contrast this with being, uh, contrast the being of God with the being with the, with the, of a material objects. In terms of nature mysticism, object exper objects experienced in sensory experience are in space and time. 
but not the object of nature mysticism. Nature mysticism means to transcend space and time, says Zainar. It means it has no sensory content to it. Implication is that anything that is beyond space and time is indivisible. It is one, we can say. Now, God is, can, Kriteis understand God as personal. Is, does it make sense? This is the theistic, as, as personal, God as person is a theistic statement, which nature mysticism, it appears as God as a, this experience as a, as that of a living presence. Even stones come alive in nature mysticism. And or what the book says, reality is not composed of dead matter. I could feel the earth speaking to me, says Jeffries. Then the twofold character. This is perhaps the most important feature for understanding the theistic concept of God. God is understood as transcendent and immanence in the theistic tradition, as I said. But divine transcendence and immanence are little understood, if not misunderstood. With the coming of deism, it is often misunderstood. Transcendence and is misunderstood as that feature of God whereby God stands outside the visible, visible world in some invisible space, confronting the visible world, but not present in it. It is almost a quotation from Peter Berger. This Understanding of transcendence is deistic, who is trans, he confronts the world but not in it. So this is deistic, not theistic. Theistic God is transcendent and immanent at the same time. Problem is how to make sense of it. Aquinas avoids the danger of deism by bringing the Plato's idea of part those who are familiar with philosophy, bringing Plato's idea of participation into uh, uh, his understanding of God. But now, if, if not, how else can we make sense of it? Nature mysticism provides another way to make sense of this theistic claim of transcendence and immanence. Understanding transcendence, an experiential approach to it would be it is seen in terms of seen in terms of nature mysticism, immanence refers to the locus of experience. And that is the world of space and time. Whereas transcendence refers to the object that is experienced. It is which is not in space and time. Object of is experienced in and through nature. That is important. There can be no transcendence without immanence in this, you know, when you when you understand this way. Because it and this is what prompts Griffiths to say nature is only a sign and a symbol of a mystery which infinitely transcends it. So the transcendence is experienced in the in nature. This agrees also with the root word transcendence, the transcendere, which means to cross the boundaries. Transcendence, now how can we understand this reality? That is, not another reality beyond the world, but a reality that is present in every bit of the physical world and still neither a part of it nor the whole of it. How to, how to make sense of it, that is the problem. Transcendence and immanence are dimensions. I shall give you two, three ideas for this. One is they are all dimensions of all reality. This is this is a fifth dimension of reality, what John Hick would say. Other which means the three dimensions of space and time, and fourth dimension of uh, three of space and one of time. So the four dimensions. The fifth, so Hick would say this is the fifth dimension of all reality. But how to conceive it? How? There are two contemporary ideas that help us to conceive this reality, to understand it. One is a Mobius strip. 
Mobius strip is one of the second is a holographic images, which is from physics. Mobius strip is a con contrivance whose inside and outside are interchangeable. I'll show you a picture of that. Where any part of the inside can become the outside and outside can become inside. That is what the Mobius that the speciality of that is, contrivance is. So too with the transcendence and immanence. Any part of the world, transcendence can be, be experienced. That's the idea. So this is a picture of a Mobius strip. See, the way it is made, this is outside here. But as it comes here, it becomes the inside. Or the, with the here it is inside, but as it comes, it eventually it becomes the outside. So depending on how you twist it. Transcendence and immanence are something like that about the whole of reality. The God can be experienced anywhere. So similarly, the transcendent is not another reality, but a fifth dimension of reality. Now, how does hologram help us to understand immanence and transcendence? Hologram is a technique that uses laser beams to create 3D images on 2D surfaces. They look so realistic that if you look at them from different angles, it will seem as if you are looking at real objects from different perspectives. A surprising feature of the hologram is that if the hologram is cut into pieces, each piece will give a view of the entire image, not a part of the image, which doesn't happen in a real kind of things. If you break the chair into two pieces, it will be one part is and the other part. But the holographic images has this speciality. The whole image will be seen in, in the, each piece. Only difference would be the image would be less sharp. So this is this is a holographic image. If it is original image, here you can see it is less sharp. That is the difference. It helps us to con conceive how reality may be understood as one integral whole, where the whole is present in every bit and in every part. Similarly, transcendence is not something that is present in any particular location to the exclusion of others. It is the one indivisible whole present in every part. So, now I shall come to the objection of Richard Dawkins that nature mysticism exists, but it has nothing to do with as many re re supernatural reality. So his objection is, nature mysticism has no connection with supernatural belief, so at best pantheism, at best uh, nature mysticism is pantheism, which is just sexed up atheism, that is the term he uses. The first response is pantheism identifies God with nature. Nature mysticism does not. Second, uh, this object experienced is not nature, but transcends nature. Second response is his definition of natural and supernatural neglect the twofold character of nature mysticism. He, these are his definitions. Supernatural is a creative intelligence lurking behind the observable universe. And natural means there's only one kind of stuff in the universe, and that is physical. And therefore, his basic objection amounts to saying, amounts to a dualistic understanding of reality, which is nature and supernature. natural world and supernatural intelligence lurking behind it. And this kind of dualism does not follow from the experience of nature mysticism, where the more cannot be experienced except in and through nature. Natural and the more than natural are not two substances as with the Descartes' body and soul. 
they are di all they are dimensions of all reality immanent transcendence so now we come to the conclusion of it basically this only I have shown how the experiential approach to nature of nature mysticism can rejuvenate the theistic idea of God. But following Aquinas, I have restricted myself to those aspects of God that are universally accessible. This can function as preambles. In Thomas Aquinas, the, his arguments for God, the philosophy arguments for God and all that functions as a preparation for theology. Same I believe this can do. So, nature mysticism teaches us nothing about specifically Christian experience. That will require something more. But what is done can be particularly helpful to those who are close to nature. So that is it. And so next, bye. So thank you for your attentive, patient listening. Questions? Is it? Yeah. Questions, clarifications? Yes. Thank you first for this wonderful presentation. And you've been preaching to convert me, so I, I have very similar <laughs> ideas myself. But, but here's something I want to help you. Yeah. Um, this one word you have not mentioned in this presentation, and that's the word spiritual. Does yeah. that word fit, or the whole experience of the spiritual, how does that fit into your story? Uh, spiritual can mean various things. That is, say, originally it has a, um, uh, biblical roots, but today it has come to be contrasted with um, religious. Today most people say, I'm, uh, not most people, a lot of people say, I'm spiritual but not religious. And that is the reason why you don't want to use that. And therefore, that is a term I don't think which has any definite meaning. That is the one reason why I, I, if you want to use that word, I have no objection. Same with mysticism. Mysticism, some people identify it with introversion and the contemplative tradition. But then the, uh, others would not do that. So these are some difficulties which are arise in the course of studying religious experience. Should we think of religion and spirituality as two different, let's say, circles? Yeah, touch? yeah. Or should we think of them as maybe one of them being bigger than the other and including religion? And that is, I would agree with that. That is where, if you consider here, when I said religious experience is soul of religion, mm -hmm. uh, there you, you might say instead of religious experience, you might put spirituality. Yeah, yeah. But only thing is spirituality, there is Christian spirituality, different kinds of spiritualities, and that is why I prefer to use the word just experience. Mm -hmm. And then I narrow down to nature mysticism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if I may continue with one more. Uh, um, you come from India. Yes. And the little experience that I have of India, yeah. I know how much easier it is in the Indian tradition to connect the natural and the religious versus a normal experience in West, uh, in the Western Europe and the United States, where nature and, and religion always seem to stand in some kind of a clash against each other. This, this world is a veil of tears. This, this, this world is not the true world in which the religious experience somehow shows itself. You have to look at the different world. Uh, this has, if I understand your question, this has two dimensions. Mm -hmm. One is the way which uh, the Westerners came to treat nature uh, with the coming of the enlightened and modernity, nature as something to be, uh, completely something to be manipulated, which has no mystical or mysterious dimensions to it. That's one dimension. Other one you are mentioning is the, this world as a veil of tears. Uh, again, it depends on if there is Matthew Fox who would interpret it as a creation, spirituality, and things of that kind, forgetting 
the great appreciation for nature which is already present there. The veil of tears, when you use the word like that, is basically referring to the human existence. It waits for fulfillment. Our existence here is, will always have a dimension of being unsatisfactory. It is not the perfect world we are in. And there is something more to which we look forward. That is the meaning of that. And therefore it is not a looking down on nature. In fact, the beauty or, or the uh, sort of the respect for nature is very much a part of uh, Christian spirituality, especially with the Franciscans and also the Benedictines. More, more with the Franciscans, of course. Yeah, I agree with you that music and art are uh, other means, ways, through which you can come to this kind of an experience. I, since I was studying mysticism, I found a class of experience there, which I found helpful, which, which people don't use it this way. I'm, I, art and music, I, I definitely agree with you. Only thing when it comes to the idea of the noetic quality, it may be a little more difficult to put in there, bring in there. Yeah, nature mysticism is not restricted to what we see. Yeah, it involves the whole of being pres just smell. In fact, now they, now I think they have brought something to America from Japan, what they call forest bathing, which it is all I being being in nature, just the smell and the sound and the sight, take it in. And his, of course, even, go, though, even those who go to nature mostly go for exercise or walk. There you are preoccupied with yourself. This is just being present. It gives you a, something of a common platform where different, uh, forgetting the differences, you can agree upon certain things. Not that important, uh, not that differences are not important, I don't say that. Difference. Unlike John Wick, I would consider differences also important. But, he, but here is there is something beyond the differences. There are also commonalities, which is what one what I want to point out. There is uh, atheism, whether justified or not, they have their reasons, uh, and therefore our, our whole approach is uh, we don't sort of uh, sort of uh, rule out anybody but we can have a dialogue with the atheist even if he has no experience he can get to know about it and some maybe some if he gets enamored of it you know, even spend time in nature and eventually he is likely to have an experience he or she I mean, I'm so sorry for using the masculine language <laughs> so this uh, therefore if an atheist yeah, probably he has had no experience of this kind. He may have heard about it, and then misunderstanding like that of um, uh, Dawkins does not even allow him to enter into it. And whereas once it is explained, it is possible that he will begin to look at it differently. And the spending time uh, or just being there in nature can make a difference. As I said, that is not the only way. Music and uh, sound, all the other kinds of things are also involved. What if Richard Dawkins provides an evolutionary explanation yeah. for this this feeling? Yeah, evolutionary. Uh, well, I do not know if he, he doesn't provide any. But um, as far as I know, but if he provides, then we'll have to look into why. Whether, what is his argument? Because this being a direct experience of the kind, uh, it is very difficult to bring in uh, as far as I can think of. But I am not ruling out the, him coming up with uh, evolutionary explanation. If he comes with it, let's face it. Extroverted mysticism is a term used by Walter Stays in his uh, book Mysticism and Philosophy. He uses that term. He is an interesting character. He went to Sri Lanka and India and all. He was, I think he's an American or British, I don't remember. So, and then he got enamored with the Upanishads, which is basically introversion. And he took that as the ideal of the, taught mysticism means introversion. And given the Christian tradition also, of mysticism is mostly emphasized that. And therefore, he said, the 
the proper mysticism is introverty mysticism, which is done in the in the monasteries and uh, or the in, in the forests and things of, or not forests, where you go within yourself. Whereas, in contrast to that, he uh, narrated experiences of this kind, which he said only a halfway house is not proper mysticism. Is on the way to being a proper mysticism. That was his idea. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions and thanks for the questions.